Now talking about ice, you never want to use ice as an ingredient if it was used to keep food cold. So it's not like we're going to recycle our ice, okay? <laughs> you, you want to transfer ice using clean and sanitized containers and scoops. When you see a lot of places will have like a, a drink dispenser and they'll, above it they'll have like an ice dispenser. Some places will actually have the ice machine on top of that ice dispenser. And that, to me that's ideal because you're not trying to carry ice in a bucket through the dining room and pouring it over because that bucket should be cleaned and sanitized. And sometimes they're using the proper ice bucket and sometimes they're using a bucket that may not be as clean as it should be, you know? And it should definitely not be a chemical plastic pail that they're using. It should be a ice bucket, you know, at least a sanitized container to put in there, a food-oriented container, because food is, ice is considered as food. Um, you never want to transfer ice containers that held chemicals or raw meat, seafood, or poultry. And then you want to store ice scoops outside the machines in a clean, protected location. On this slide, it's showing you a container. Now, that container can actually come up off that machine, and you can send that through the, the dish machine. So that can be washed and cleaned. Now, some uh, ice machines actually have a built-in holder inside the ice machine where they can put that scoop, and that's okay, but the trouble is the reason you don't want to leave that scoop in the ice machine is you're holding it by the handle. And if it tips over, it's going to, the handle's going to wind up in the ice, it's going to contaminate the ice. Um, you never want to use a glass to scoop ice or touch ice with your hands because when you're scooping it up like that, it's um, with an, especially with a glass, you're contaminating the ice and there's a danger of the glass breaking whether it's plastic or glass, and then you have a real problem with physical hazards inside that ice machine. Um, before I go off on this, uh, another thing you want to see is when they're sc scooping up the ice, you don't want them to see them holding like, say if they're doing uh, the pictures for resident rooms. You don't want to see them holding that pitcher, which they've just brought out of a resident's room, over the ice bucket and pouring ice in there with the scoop and all the ice is, some of the ice is going in the pitcher and some of it's going down the side of the pitcher and back into that ice uh, container. And then they're doing it again. So that's a, another means of cross-contamination. Uh, another thing you have to consider with ice, sometimes you want to use ice to keep food cold. Uh, you have to be careful with that because you, ice is going to melt. So if you have it in a self-draining container, like if you have a, a full pan and then you have a perforated full pan on top of that and you have the ice on top of that so that the ice can drain, as it melts, it can drain into the bottom pan, that's okay. But you don't want to have it where the ice is going to be melting and you have like milk cartons floating in, icy, in, in the ice water and because you can have pinpricks in things like cardboard uh, milk cartons and you can actually have milk leaking out, think water leaking in, it's just, you know, it's a cross-contamination nightmare. So that's the only thing about that. Miss Marie will tell you about that. <laughs> um, we're not going to talk about variances because this is something that you would not have really in a smoking meat and all that. You're probably, not, unless you're in a really highfalutin nursing home, I don't think you're going to see that. Okay, we're going to talk about minimum internal cooking temperatures. For poultry, whole or ground chicken, turkey or duck, it's 165 degrees Fahrenheit and it says for 15 seconds. That means when you stick that thermometer in that chicken leg or turkey breast or whatever, it should hold the temperature 
for at least 15 seconds at 165 degrees Fahrenheit or above. Okay? Uh, any stuffing that you make with fish, meat, or poultry, again, that should be 165 degrees. Uh, any stuffed meat. Uh, there was a case in Maryland when I was up there. They had they did a stuffed ham. They stuffed it with greens, and they had a it was a it was a regional delicacy. And they had uh, uh, one of these, you know, supper special suppers, and everybody got sick because it wasn't cooked to the proper temperature. It had been stuffed with the greens and all that. So it's it it can happen. Um, and then any dishes that include previously cooked. TCS ingredients, you need to cook it up to 165 degrees. For example, if you have, if you've made chili and you made it the day before, you put it in the refrigerator, you cooled it down, say you cooled it properly and all that, but still you would want to heat it up to a minimum of 165 degrees Fahrenheit because it's a leftover. And the same thing kind of applies with the, the steam table line. If, they, if they're out there, they, they, it's got to be a minimum of 135 degrees for the steam table for holding. If it falls below that, you need to heat it back up to 165 degrees before you put it back on the steam table, if it falls below the holding temperature. Think of it as, of it as a leftover, okay? All right. Uh, minimum internal temperature for ground beef, as in beef, pork, or any other ground meat, 155 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 seconds. Also for injected meats, mechanically tenderized meat like cube steaks, ratites, including ostrich and emu, like we're going to see that in the menu, but it's possible. <laughs> I don't think so, but maybe. Ground seafood. Uh, again, because this has more surface area. Remember we talked about that? When you grind it up, there's more surface area to that meat, more chances for it becoming a source for bacteria, a surface for bacteria to grow on. And any shell eggs, as in not pasteurized shell eggs, just regular shell eggs that will be hot held for service, they have to meet a minimum internal te cooking temperature of 155 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so that's why you want to use pasteurized eggs. <laughs> Minimum internal temperature for seafood, including fish, shellfish, and crustaceans. Also for steaks, chops of pork, beef, veal, and lamb. Any commercially raised game. They apparently commercially raised deer, apparently. I don't know. And any shell eggs that will be served immediately are cooked to a minimum of 145 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. And then this is for a roast. Roast of pork, beef, veal, and lamb uh, should be 145 degrees Fahrenheit for four minutes. It needs to hold at 145 degrees Fahrenheit for four minutes on that thermometer. And then for Fruit, vegetables, grains, beans, refried beans, whatever that's going to be hot held for service, you want to cook it to a minimum internal cooking temperature of 135 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that does not mean that you put it on the steam table and warm it up. It's got to be heated up on a, on a true stove or oven, whatever, to 135 degrees Fahrenheit. The hot hold, the steam table is only maintaining at 135 degrees or higher. Y'all got that? Okay. Uh, and then this is, now this is not going to be real clear in your handout. Cooking TCS food in the microwave oven. If the it's in the top in that handout. It's hard to read, so you may want to highlight that. The minimum internal cooking temperature is 165 degrees Fahrenheit for meat, seafood, poultry, eggs. And you, if you look at your um, frozen food things from the, on your Swanson dinners or whatever, it's, it's, it'll tell you 145 deg 165 degrees Fahrenheit. 
and then guidelines for microwave cooking that should sound familiar, as much microwave cooking as we do in frozen foods. Uh, cover food to prevent the surface from drying out, rotate or stir it halfway through so the heat reaches the food e more evenly. And let it stand for at least two minutes after cooking to let the food temperature even out. And check the temperature in at least two places to make sure the food is cooked through. So, um, if your menu includes raw or undercooked TCS food items, well, we're not going to do this in a nursing home, but you'll notice it in menus at restaurants. They'll, they'll let you know that you, you, there's a danger, that there's a possibility it may be a problem. That's why they put those notices on there to kind of cover themselves, to let you know you're taking a risk. Okay, FDA consumer advisories. Um, the FDA advises against offering these items on a children's menu if they are raw or undercooked meat, poultry, seafood, and egg because, again, children are a high-risk group. Um, if partially cooking meat, seafood, poultry, or eggs or, egg, eggs or dishes containing these items, never cook the food longer than 60 minutes during initial cooking. This is partial cooking during prepping. This would be like, say, you, you have a, you're going to have a barbecue and you want to go ahead and pre-cook the egg, cook the chicken part way before you take it and finish it off on the grill. That's what they're talking about here. Um, you'd have to cool it immediately after initially cooking. Uh, we freeze or refrigerate the food after cooking it and then heat it to a required minimum internal temperature before selling or serving it. So you, like with chicken, you could, you could partially cook it, cook, properly cool it down, take it to the site under proper refrigeration type, <laughs> like in a cooler or something, and then cook it to 165 degrees internal temperature. Put your barbecue sauce on it. That could happen. Um, cooling requirements, okay. The first two hours, if you're trying to cool something down, you want to get it from 135 degrees Fahrenheit to at least 70 degrees Fahrenheit within the first two hours. And then you have four more hours, if you've done that, because remember that was the really bad temperature range for bacteria growth. 135 to 70. So if you can get it down to 70 degrees within the first two hours, then you have four more hours to get it down to 41 degrees Fahrenheit or below. So that's, that's like a total of six hours, right? To get it back down to the proper, but, but you've got to get it past that really bad temperature danger zone of 135 to 70 within the first two hours. If you don't, what they have you do is you have to heat it back up to 165 again and then start all over trying to bring it in. But you can only do that one time. So it better be, if you're going to have to go through all that, it's something you really want to save. <laughs> okay. Now, if you cool food from 135 degrees Fahrenheit to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, in less than two hours, you can use the remaining time to cool it to 41 degrees Fahrenheit or lower. The total cooling time cannot be longer than six hours. So if you cool food from 135 degrees Fahrenheit to 70 degrees Fahrenheit in only one hour, well, then you've got five hours to get the food down to 41 degrees if you have to. But if you've already cooled, if you cool it down that fast in one hour, I'm sure it's going to be cool before then. But you have a total of six hours. Y'all got that? Okay. But it has to be below 70 degrees Fahrenheit in that first two hours. Okay. Before cooling food, you can start by reducing it in size. And there are ways you can do that. Like if you have a, uh, a roast, you can cut it into smaller pieces. You can, if you've got it in a big pot, a big stock pot, you can put it into smaller pans. Like maybe not any higher than two inches. Um, shallow pans. Uh, you can also do things like place it in an ice water bath where you have like a, a big pan of ice and water and you put your pot, your, your, your container in there and you can stir it and then you can stir it with an ice paddle. 
an ice paddle is like they have like these plastic hollowed out paddles. They're kind of like a, just a, you know, like a stir. And they, you put water in it, you freeze it in the freezer so you have this big ice cube and you're stirring this pot of stew with an ice cube. Or you can add ice as an ingredient to help bring the, the temperature down. Like you're doing a soup and you want to have a little bit more water added to it, you can add some ice to it. That's another way to cool it down. Or a, there is, I know, at least one nursing home that has a blast chiller, which is an expensive piece of equipment, but it's great for cooling food down quickly if you have leftovers. Okay. Uh, when storing food for further cooling, you want to loosely cover your food containers before storing them. And food can be left uncovered if protected from contamination. Like you can, um, you don't want to let store an uncovered item underneath food that could contaminate it, like a meat or something like that. An example would be Jello. You've just made Jello. You're trying to make gelatin salads. Have y'all ever done that? You know, like it's like from the '50s, Jello salad. <laughs> okay, okay. I know it's before your time, but anyway. So you put those in there. We used to have it every day, at least one congealed salad in, at the hospital. And you put it in there, and it's like steaming. I'm mean, steaming hot. And she would put. You can put it like on the on the top shelf, where you can have like a. They have what they call. Um, Oh, speed racks, which is like this stand that you can put pans in like this. And so basically the pan above is covering the pan below. And you put it in there to let it cool. And you leave it uncovered so it can cool faster. Because if you cover it with saran wrap, it's just going to cold that heat in there. It's going to take longer for it to cool down. But you could, another thing you could do is you could cover it with saran wrap or something and, and put uh, slits in it so the steam can escape. And then after it cools down, you can cover it more properly. And of course, you're going to want to, if you're going to keep it in there for more than 24 hours, you're going to have to label it with what it is and the use by date. Okay. Uh, food reheated for immediate service can be reheated. To any temperature if it was cool, cooked and cooled correctly. But if it's reheated for hot holding, it must be reheated to an internal temperature of 165 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 seconds within two hours. This is what you're going to wind up most of the time. Just forget that one above that. Just, <laughs> just go away with that. Because Everything we're going to have is hot holding. It's either going to be, it's going to be usually put on a steam table line. If you have a, a, a if you, however, if you have something like a can of soup that was in a, can, in a, in a properly, it was, it's Campbell's soup. You don't have to, you can heat it up to at least 135 degrees because it was commercially processed. But if you've made chili in the facility, You've cooled it down. You did cool it down properly and everything, but if you're going to put it on the steam table, you're going to reheat it to 165 degrees Fahrenheit within two hours. Does that make sense? That first one is kind of... When they're, what they're talking about there is you heat it up for immediate service. In other words, you're serving it right now. Like, I'm, making, I'm heating it up and I'm giving it to you right now. Like, there's no holding in, involved. But it would have had to have been cooked to the proper internal temperature and cooled correctly. And the only way you're going to know you did that is if you timed it, checked the temperatures, documented it. So it's, you, which is all good to do and probably should be done more than it is. Okay, that's it. Any questions? Hot holding. What's the hot holding temperature? 135, that's right. If you're going to have to reheat something for hot holding, what do you have to heat it up to? If it's, 165. 165. General rules for holding food include um, 
time temperature controlled for safety food, TCS food, needs to be held at the correct temperature for hot food at 135 degrees Fahrenheit and for cold food 41 degrees Fahrenheit. And you want to check the temperatures at least every four hours. Now most nursing homes we're going to be going in do not have tray lines that last that long, but they may last you know, over an hour and some some nursing homes will um, check the temperatures at, in the middle of the tray line just to verify what they are. Uh, if it's been more than four, if it's been four hours, at, at four hours you want to throw the food out if it's not at 41 degrees Fahrenheit or lower and you want to check the temperature every two hours to leave time for corrective action. Um, Never use hot holding equipment to reheat food unless it's designed for it. So most steam tables that you're going to see are not designed to reheat food. They should not be putting the food in there to heat it up. They should heat it up on the stove or in the oven. So you want to reheat the food correctly and then move it to a holding unit. And holding units, usually we refer to those as steam tables. Most of y'all have seen the steam table. You know what I'm talking. Like when you go to a cafeteria, you see those those stainless steel tables. They have the holes in it, and they put the food pans in there. Okay. And there's usually water underneath that's heated up, so therefore the steam table issue to keep the food hot. Now, cold food can be held without temperature control for up to six hours. In other words without it being um, maintained like with a cooling unit. Uh, if, if, it, if it was held at 41 degrees Fahrenheit or lower before removing it from refrigeration and it does not exceed 70 degrees Fahrenheit during the six hours and you want to throw food out that exceeds this temperature. So if, if you're, if it was like a picnic, I guess, or a cookout, they could have it out there as long as it doesn't exceed 70 degrees. Now, if it's 4th of July, it's probably going to get over 70 degrees pretty fast. But uh, inside, you could have a buffet. And as long as that food does not exceed 70 degrees, it's okay. But... It's supposed to also have a label specifying the time it was removed from refrigeration and the time that it must be thrown out. And if, it, if it's, um, it's got to be either sold, served, or thrown out within six hours. That's if you don't have any kind of refrigeration on it. Now, most places that you're going to see are going to have a, they'll have like a air curtain refrigerator or something where they can pull things out of, but... Now, hot food can be held without temperature control, in other words, no steam table, for up to four hours if it was held at 135 degrees Fahrenheit or higher before removing it from temperature control. And it has a label specifying when the item must be thrown out. It's got to be sold, served, or thrown out within four hours. Now this is just an example of handling dishes and glassware. If the top row is correct, the bottom is incorrect. Um, you don't want to be holding glasses, you know, like in the stack like that because you're touching the, the portion that people are going to be putting their math on and that would be a cross-contamination issue. Same thing with the plate. You can hold the plate at the edge, uh, but you don't want to be putting your thumb in the middle of the plate. Now if they've got, they're wearing Gloves, they can get away with a little bit more of their thumb on the plate, but it should be on the edge anyway. Um, as far as silverware, they should be, once it's you know been washed and sanitized, it should be handled by the handle, not, not by the eating end, because that would be a source of cross-contamination. Uh, same thing with things like uh, biscuits, uh, bagels. You want to use tongs instead of handling it directly with your hands unless you're wearing gloves. You can, if you're wearing a fresh pair of gloves, you can do that. Uh, ice, 
a, a proper ice scoop should be used and not a glass. Again, because you're going to be touching the ice when you scoop in there with the ice, with a glass. Um, you want to prevent contamination when serving food by wearing single-use gloves whenever handling ready-to-eat food. Uh, as an alternative, you can use spatulas, tongs, deli sheets, or other utensils. So you don't have to just depend on gloves. Um, you want to use clean and sanitized utensils for serving. Use a separate utensil for each food. And you want to clean and sanitize utensils after each task. And at a minimum, clean and sanitize them at least every, once every four hours. So if you're talking about like a cafeteria, that's where that would come into to play. Um, as I say, most nursing homes, well, they, have, they do have some buffet areas. And that would apply there. If it's more than four hours, they need to take it up and, and clean them. But usually it's not that long. Um, prevent contamination when serving food. You want to store serving utensils correctly between uses, uh, either on a clean and sanitized food contact surface or in the food with a handle extended above the container rim. So, so if you're Using, if you're wearing gloves, even then you, you want to keep it up because it's, otherwise it's going to fall in there and then you're going to wind up touching that with your gloves and you're touching everything else and it's just, you know, it makes a mess. Uh, presets tableware. You want to prevent it from becoming contaminated uh, by either wrapping or covering the items and you don't have to um, have it wrapped if you're going to remove it when guests are seated or if if they're cleaned and sanitized after the guests have left. Now, for our purposes, if, if you've got um, a nursing home residents coming into a dining room, they can, have the, they, can, they, they can have the silverware wrapped and have it right there. As long as it's not going to get contaminated, it's fine. Or they, they may wait till the guest comes in and they'll put the silverware down for them and handle it by the handles. Because we're getting more, much more toward fine dining in some of these dining, in some of these nursing homes. Uh, they don't even want them, if they're in the dining room, to keep the tray underneath. They want them to take the food off the tray and put it on the table. Okay, we don't have to worry about that. Um, you're never supposed to reserve food returned by one customer to another customer. I'm sure y'all are familiar with that from hospitals. Uh, also, you're not supposed to reserve plate garnishes. You know, a garnish would be like, you know, like a cherry tomato on top of a little piece of lettuce or something like that. So once it's gone out, it's gone out. Um, any uncovered condiments, uneaten breads or rolls. Now, in a In the nursing home, once it goes in there, they, that's, it's, it's gone. But in a restaurant, they could reuse their condiment packets. Um, prevent contamination, you use knees guards if it's a buffet. Uh, and you want to be identifying food items in a buffet. Again, you want to keep raw meat, fish, and poultry separate from ready-to-eat food. This would be in a self-service area. There, I'm not, you'd see probably this more in a um, assisted living facility with a self-service area. Um, but one thing you'll notice, you're really not supposed to let customers refill dirty plates or use dirty utensils at self-service area. Because if you think about it, if they come back, if you come back with your dirty plate, they always want to give you a fresh, get you a fresh plate. Because if you come back up there with your dirty plate and you're using the serving spoon to dip some food onto your plate, the chances are you're going to touch your dirty plate. And then you put it back in there and, and contaminate the entire pot of food. And this is, we're not, we're going to skip this. Um, there is some use of off-site service in, in nursing homes, you'd want to use insulated food grade containers when you're delivering food off-site from the main kitchen because you may have a satellite area that you're serving. Um, and of course those in those carts, usually it's a cart that you're using, uh, would need to be regularly cleaned 
and you've got to check your internal food temperatures, you want to check it before it leaves the kitchen and when it gets to the off-site area. And the food should be labeled with the use by date time and reheating and service instructions. But that can be a little bit, uh, in a nursing home they're going to know. Usually it's just down like to another building. So of course, in this case, uh, you're probably not going to have raw meat, poultry, and seafood being transferred to a, a different area in a nursing home situation, but in another one you obviously keep that separate from your cooked food. Now this is just to give you, looking at it from the management point of view, um, this is a group of practices and procedures intended to prevent foodborne illness and you actively control risk and hazards throughout the flow of food. So for foundation for a food safety management system, you're going to want to have a personal hygiene program, a food safety training program, a supplier selection and specification program, a quality control assurance and assurance pro program, cleaning and sanitation program, facility design and equipment maintenance program, a standard, you want to have some standard operating procedures, and then a pest control program. Active managerial control will focus on controlling these five factors for foodborne illness risks. You want to purchase food from unsafe, you don't want to purchase food from unsafe sources. <laughs> You do, you, uh, failing to cook food adequately, holding food at incorrect temperatures, using contaminated equipment, or practicing poor personal hygiene. All those can lead to foodborne illness. And you want to do this in different ways. You have training programs. You're going to have manage, manager supervision, which means actually getting out and watching and interacting with the staff. Um, incorporation of standard operating procedures, and HACCP. Now HACCP is a program that started back with the space program when you had people going up into space and you were having to fix food that they can eat in a, in a weightless environment. Well, the last thing you wanted to do was have someone get foodborne illness in a space capsule. So, I really started thinking about food safety, and they came up with the HACCP program, which is the, I don't have it on here, Hazard Analysis Critical Control Point. I believe that's the correct. You want to monitor critical activities in the operation. You want to take ne necessary corrective action when required, and you want to verify that the action is taken control the risk factors. Now the FDA also provides recommendations for controlling the common risk factors. Um, they want to see that knowledge can be demonstrated, that you have the staff health controls, controlling hands as a vehicle of contamination, time temperature parameters for controlling pathogens, and of course they give out consumer advisories. The HACCP approach is based on identifying significant biological, chemical, or physical hazards at specific points within a product's flow through an operation. And then once identified, those hazards can be prevented, eliminated, or reduced to safe levels. So they figure out what the critical control points are and how, what, what they're going to do about it. Uh, to be effective, a HACCP plan must be based on a written document. It must be specific to each facility's menu, customers, equipment, processes, and operation, and a plan that works for one operation may not work for another. The seven principles of HACCP are, you first conduct a hazard analysis. You determine the critical control points, or the CCPs. You establish critical limits, like a critical limit might be, um, we expect the food on the tray line or on the steam table to not go below 135 degrees Fahrenheit and we want to see it, I mean that would be the main, that would be a critical limit. Establish monitoring procedures like how often you're going to check that temperature. Uh, identify corrective actions. 
verify that the system works, and establish procedures for record keeping and documentation. So principle one, conduct a hazard analysis. You identify potential hazards in the food served by looking at it and how it's processed and identify TCS items and determine where hazards are likely to occur for each one. Looking for biological, chemical, and physical contaminants. Principle two, determine critical control points. Find points in the process where identified hazards can be prevented, eliminated, or reduced. Those are the CCPs. Establish critical limits. For each CCP, you establish a minimum or maximum limit. And these limits are met to prevent or eliminate the hazard. Like, for example, with poultry, you're going to have an internal cooking temperature of 165 degrees Fahrenheit. And you establish monitoring procedures to determine the best way to check for those critical limits to make sure they're met. And identify you have to identify who's going to monitor it and how often. Uh, identify steps that must be taken when critical limit is not met, and you have to determine that in advance. So, um, principle six is verifying that the system works, determine if the plan's working or not. Uh, you evaluate it. You can use charts, you can use records. Uh, you want to determine if it's actually reducing or eliminating hazards and then establish procedures for record keeping and documentation. Now, a lot of places aren't going to have a full-blown HACCP plan, but they are going to have certain aspects of it, especially if it's a um, food service that has a uh, food service management company. They're going to have a lot of the standard operating procedures. They're going to have their uh, set recipes. They're going to have um, a lot of the policies and procedures already done for the, for the facility. <coughs> now, the minimum they'll at least have is they'll have they'll keep track of the temperatures. Ideally, they should be keeping track of the internal temperatures of the of the foods that they're cooking. That's the um, time temperature control for for safety foods, like your poultry, your meats, uh, stews, things like that. Check for the internal temperature and at the minimum, and then also maintain the uh, hot holding equip equipment so that you can meet the 135 degrees or, or higher temperature for holding food. And they'll also keep a record of that. Okay. And we're not going to worry about this uh, or this. Uh, crisis management, they should have it at minimum a written plan for what to do if there is a crisis, if there's an emergency. That's why you have your emergency food stores and they should have a telephone tree. Uh, they have, have a plan of what in general they're going to do. Who's going to be in charge? Like if the manager can't make it in, the cook's going to be in charge. I mean, what's going to, they're going to have some kind of plan. Um, they may have to use staff from other areas to help serve if, if not everyone can come in. But there should be a general plan, like where they're going to get water. Uh, can they get emergency water brought in? Some places actually have their own water tank. There's the place up in Huntsville, which is, they have a lot of military people in it, so yeah, that would, they, they plan for everything. <laughs> so, um, so you want to have a crisis or emergency plan, and they should be able to share that with you. Um, they should also have a... Uh, plan in case there's a foodborne illness outbreak, but there's, that's basically on their, based on their food safety program and training staff on food safety policies and procedures. Uh, and there's a defense called reasonable care where they, they, it shows that like they're keeping track of the temperatures or they're making sure that their temperatures of the refrigeration is correct and things like that. 
they do as, as much as they can to make sure that they don't have a food borne illness. But you still might have one, it's possible. Um, food borne illness uh, incident report, they'll want to keep track of things like what and when the customer ate at the operation, when they first got sick, what their symptoms were. Because if someone calls in and says, I think I got sick here at your facility, they, they need to start writing stuff down. Uh, and the thing is, you, as you, as you can already, already tell, they might have gotten sick there, they might have gotten sick from someplace else, or maybe even from at home. So you're not going to say, well, I'm so sorry you got sick at our facility, but you say, I'm so sorry you, you're sick. Tell me what, what you ate here. When were you here? Uh, did you, when did you first notice getting sick? I mean, get the information from them. Get, first get their name and phone number and address and all that first. That, so that's the sort of things that they're looking at so that they can assist the health department if it comes to that. Because if you have just one person calling, it might just not be, there, there might not be any link whatsoever. But if you have like five people calling in, there, there's a problem. Okay. Um, a lot of this is for management of a, of a restaurant facility. But you do want to take the complaint, any complaint like that, seriously. Um, if, if for some reason uh, a food board illness occurs while you're at a facility, you want to see what they're going to do. Are they getting the information down? Are they contacting the health department? The health department should be contacted if there is an issue. Because you're, you're not the one. They're, if they come to you expecting you're going to handle it, say, no, we need to call the health department, <laughs> okay? Because they're set up for that. Um, okay. Okay. And so this is just an example of what you would do if a customer calls in to report a foodborne illness. Or the facility would do. The only thing is with the facility, they've got a captive audience. So you're going to know if there's a problem. If all of a sudden after they've had turkey and dressing, half the the facility is throwing up and having diarrhea. There's an issue, unless it may be the flu, but there's something's going on. Okay, and most places have an infection control nurse, an infect infection control committee. Okay. Now, if. Uh, and sometimes they can set aside the suspected product and have tests run on it. You put it in the refrigerator, you know, label it, date it. Date it. And if it might be caused by a sick staff member. And so that's, main, that's when you want to look at your list, at your, at your uh, schedule to see who was here and when they were there and what they fixed and interview those residents, I mean those employees about their health status. Uh, so, and the, this is just crisis management right here. And it may, may require cleaning and sanitizing the entire operation and establishing new procedures. Okay. Now, this is, uh, more, you, a lot of what you'd, you might see, power outages, uh, a fire, uh, flood, water interruption, sewage backup. If there's a risk, significant risk to the safety and security of food, you've got to stop your service. Um, and of course, the local regulatory authority must be notified. I was involved with a facility that the uh, thermostat went out on the fryer and suddenly the kitchen starts filling up with smoke. And the staff got the residents out of the dining room. I mean, it was like an uh, assisted living type situation. And we had, we had to pull the, um, they pulled the, the cord on the uh, fire extinguisher. So the whole kitchen was covered with white powder. 
the fire trucks were coming. The place was filling up with smoke. The nurses were closing the doors because at least they, they had been trained on to, on to do that. Uh, what do you do in a fire? And they were closing those doors. And if they needed to, they moved the residents to a, a different area. But it was pretty scary. We didn't actually have flames, but there was a lot of smoke, and that could have killed somebody right there. So the, the health department was notified. Uh, everybody pitched in and helped clean up the kitchen because when that white powder goes all over your kitchen, you got to wipe down the whole place. So, and they were ready to start service the next morning. So it's water interruption. You may have to, I was at another place where um, the water main was broken. We, we couldn't verify that the water was not contaminated, so we had to go on to our emergency water plan. So all these things can ha actually happen. So they have to be have different contingencies for different situations. Obviously, you can't possibly imagine everything that's going to happen, but you can have a pretty good idea. Um, this, they're talking about a construction plan review. Uh, occasionally you might get asked about something like this, but be very careful <laughs> because if they ask you a question, they're going to hold you to it when the next surveyor comes in. So say, so, well, you know, I'm sure you've got your consultants. <laughs> but construction plans, um, that's really where you can make changes in the design and how the food flows through a system, so they need to spend some time on that. Uh, Well-designed kitchen will address workflow. It's got to keep food out of the danger zone as much as possible, and it must limit the number of times the food is handled. So like you start off with the delivery, you get into the storerooms and refrigerators units, and you have your preparation, then you have your uh, cooking areas, then you have your surfing areas, service areas. But you, And then, of course, you also have to bring it back in to wash all the dishes and get all those pots and pans and dishes back into service again. A uh, well-designed kitchen will address contamination. Uh, the risk of cross-contamination is going to be minimized. Placing equipment to prevent slashing or spillage from one piece of equipment to another. Like if you've got a uh, pan washing sink, I sometimes they have these teeny tiny hand washing things. You can't even wash your hands without water splashing all over the place. And of course, right next to that is where they're storing the pots and pans. So you're going to, that's, contamin that's potential for contamination, unless they've got put a, a little barrier there. Um, equipment accessibility. You want to place equipment so staff can easily clean the facility and all equipment. Uh, some places will have their large equipment on, on wheels, you know, so they can move it out. Uh, others, they're just going to have to use a long-handled broom to get back there and, and to mop it. And then, of course, you have some stand-in-place equipment that you have to wash. Flooring. It should be smooth, durable, non-absorbent, and easy to clean. And that's, you're going to have to have that in, like, your walk-in coolers. You have to have, be able to clean that. Your prep and food storage areas, your dishwashing areas, your restrooms, and dressing and locker rooms, too. Now, a lot of places will have um, the housekeeping department actually clean their restrooms, if they have restrooms inside the, the kitchen. And it's just, a, again, kind of a not, a, trying to avoid any possibility of cross-contamination. Coving. Now you're going to see that. Coving is a curved sealed edge placed between the floor and the wall and it eliminates the sharp corners or gaps that are hard to clean. It's like they've got coving here. See? Right there. That's coving. At the bottom, that little strip, and it's, it's smooth there so you can easily mop and, and sweep there without food getting trapped in the crevice. Um, but it's got to be glued to the wall <laughs> and it's it should be fulfilling its purpose. And it also can eliminate hiding places for pests if it is properly attached to the wall. Okay. Interior walls and ceilings should be smooth, non-absorbent, durable, and easy to clean. Hand washing stations 
must be conveniently located and are required in restrooms or directly next to them, in food prep areas, dish service areas, and dishwashing areas. And hand washing sinks must only be used for hand washing. Uh, hand washing stations must have hot and cold running water, soap, a way to dry hands, and a garbage can container for your uh, hand towel, and they should have signage. Now, NSF is a, I think it's a National Sanitation Foundation or Sanit Sanitation Foundation, I think. Uh, it ensures food service equipment with surfaces that are non-absorbent, smooth, corrosion resistant, easy to clean, durable, and resistant to damage. And dishwashing machines, now that's You'll see different types of dishwashing machines. There'll be some that look like a little box that you continually raise up the sides. Uh, and then there's some that'll be like a flight type where it's like a conveyor, big conveyor belt. Um, dishwashers should be installed so they're reachable and conveniently located uh, in a way that keeps utensils, equipment, and other food contact surfaces from becoming contaminated. Now, a lot of these uh, little nursing homes will have They'll actually have a wall. <laughs> They'll put up a wall so that you've got like the clean side of the dish machine and the dirty side of the dish machine, trying to, again, prevent contamination. And that's actually not a bad idea. Um, then you're going to have, you have detergents, uh, sanitizers, some, some use sanitizers. Uh, they should definitely have a way to measure the water temperature, the water pressure, and whether or not they're about to run out of, if, if, if they're about to run out of soap. Um, now there is a, usually a, in this, they, they show you a uh, little tag. It's usually a permanent metal tag or, or a, label that's attached to the dish machine that tells you what temperatures are minimum for cleaning, for washing and sanitizing. Or now for cold water sanitizing, it's a little different, but they, they also have that up there too, usually. Okay. The three compartment sinks. This is for manual dishwashing you have a wash, rinse, and sanitizing sink. And they should be large enough to accommodate any equipment. I've seen them really tiny, and I've seen them really big. But you may have, um, in the final sink, the sanitizing sink, it's either going to be hot water sanitation, where they actually have like a, uh, a coil to heat up the water and then or they may have a sanitizing solution that's put in there. All right, as far as installing and maintaining the equipment, if it's a floor mounted piece of equipment, it should be mounted on legs at least six inches off the floor or if it's directed contact with the floor, it should be sealed to the base of the floor so that you don't have insects going, you know, hiding under there and coming out. And six inches off the floor so you can clean, sweep and clean underneath it. Tabletop equipment should be either mounted on legs at least four inches high or sealed to the countertop. I'm talking about like coffee machines, uh, an ice cream machine, things like that. Of course, once in equipment's been installed, it's got to be maintained. Um, should have a maintenance, a cleaning schedule, and probably a maintenance schedule also. Like a lot of times, the uh, maintenance department will be in charge of maintaining the ice machine, make sure it's cleaned on at least a monthly basis. 
You have to have a good water supply, approved public, public water mains. Um, cross connection. This would be a physical link between safe water and dirty water from drains, sewers, or other wastewater sources. You don't want to see that because that will contaminate your, water, your safe water supply. This is trying to show some examples of that, like um, backflow is a reverse flow of contaminants through a cross connection into the drinkable water supply. Like if in this picture they have your, your faucet, which is connected to your safe water supply, and then they've got a hose that's going down into a bucket of dirty wa mop water. Well, if you have like a, you know, sometimes you have like a vacuum in the water supply and it'll, whatever's in there will, in that bucket will be pulled up in through that hose into the faucet contaminating water. Uh, another example would be um, if you had a um, drain that went into a floor drain because there's supposed to be an air gap and for like food production sinks unless well some counties have a, a, a different type of plumbing they can use but if it's actually if it's supposed to have an air gap and it's going into the floor sink if you have a backup of sewage that's again going to go up into it can siphon up into your prep sink, your pot and pan sink, even it up into your dishwasher. Um, back siphonage is a vacuum created in the plumbing system that sucks contaminants back into the water supply. Uh, so you're actually, you would normally have an air gap between the faucet and the top of the sink, but they've, they've destroyed that air gap by attack, attaching that hose so it goes into a bucket. Then you've got an air gap in this picture. See where the drain is? It's got an open drain, it's got a, a, a drain, and then it's got a floor drain and with an air gap there. So there are a couple of uh, backflow prevention methods. You've got your, there's a vacuum breaker. And then the most common thing in a uh, kitchen that you're gonna see is the air gap between the the top of the sink where you're, and the faucet, so the faucet's not in the sink. So if it starts to overflow, it's gonna just overflow on the floor. <laughs> it's not gonna go back in the water supply. Uh, the air gap on the, the drain underneath the sink, you've got the air gap, it should be at least an inch between the end of that um, drain from the sink to the floor drain, the open floor drain. So if, there's a, if there is a backup of sewage in the operation, the affected area should be closed right away. The problem must be corrected and the area must be thoroughly cleaned. Um, if the backup is a significant risk to food safety, you're going to have to stop service and notify the health department. Lighting, uh, it should be, you need to be able to see what you're doing. and. All lights should have a shatter resistant light bulb or protective cover. And of course, the, uh, any burned out bulb should be replaced with the correct size bulbs. Ventilation systems must be cleaned and maintained to prevent grease and condensation from building up on walls and ceilings. I mean, you don't want to see a, a vent above a food prep area that's dripping water because where's that? dirty water coming from that's dripping on, that's onto your food prep table. Okay. Garbage should be removed from prep areas as quickly as possible, being careful not to contaminate food and food contact surfaces. And uh, the garbage cans that are in the facility, in, in the kitchen, should be cleaned frequently, to again, to help keep down the odor, keep uh, pests from attracting pests. 
and those and they should be cleaned away from the food prep and storage areas. So there's, there's, they should have an area where they can clean carts, clean garbage cans, clean uh, mop buckets, things like that. Okay, indoor containers for garbage must be leak proof, waterproof, and pest proof, easy to clean, and covered when not in use. Um, now, if they're over there peeling potatoes and they're throwing, you know, they're getting rid of, that's, you, you don't have to have the lid on it right there, but if nobody's putting stuff in there, the lid should be on there, especially when you're taking it out to the dumpster. Designated storage areas that store waste and recyclables separately from food and food contact services. Uh, storage of those things should not create a nuisance or a public health hazard. Um, outdoor containers must be placed on a smooth, durable, non-absorbent surface. Usually it's asphalt or concrete. They should have tight-fitting lids and be covered at all times, unless you're putting stuff in there, and have their drain plugs in place. That's, a, that's an example of a dumpster. It's got, um, that, that's the type you just raise up the lid to put the stuff in there. There are some that are taller than that. With, they have the lids like that, but you're, the staff is opening up a side door to put the items in. And the trouble is they've got to close that side door back. You don't want to come and find everything wide open because that's just, and especially with garbage in there, because it's going to, even in bags, because wild animals can will climb in there, go through it, and the next thing you got rats and everything else that are going in there. So it's, and then it's usually within reasonable proximity to the nursing home, so that's, it puts the nursing home at danger to being infiltrated by pests also. Cleaners are supposed to be stable and non-corrosive and safe to use in a kitchen area. When using them, always follow the manufacturer's instructions. Do not use one type of detergent in place of another unless the intended use is the same. And do not mix chemicals. Types of detergents are general purpose detergents which remove dirt from floors, walls, ceilings, prep surfaces, and most equipment surfaces. And then you've got the heavy duty detergents that remove wax, like off, the, off a wax floor, uh, aged or dried dirt, and baked on grease. Your degreasers and things like that, delimers. Degreasers have ingredients for dis dissolving, dissolving grease and they work really well on burned on grease. You're gonna use that uh, in your ovens, uh, the uh, range hoods, things like that. Delimers are used on mineral deposits uh, and other dirt that cleaners can't remove. You're gonna see that on the steam tables. You know, like the, the white kind of built up film on inside of a dish machine or uh, on some of these steam tables. That's from the water evaporating and leaving behind the minerals, and they just kind of start building up on the metal. So it's it's like you're trying to remove a rock, actually. So it's it's uh, you have to have a special cleaner for that. Usually, about once a week, they'll use a delimer it's on the on the dish machine, at least, and on the also on the steam table. Uh, abrasive cleaners have a scouring agent to scrub dirt off, but they can scratch surfaces and they can also uh, leave behind a residue. So usually you don't see too many cans of Ajax in a kitchen. Sometimes you'll, you'll have some maybe occasionally, but the, usually most food service companies prefer the, their employees not use them. Uh, sanitizing. Surfaces can be sanitized either by heat or by chemicals. Now the heat, the water must be at least 171 degrees Fahrenheit and you would immerse the item for 30 seconds. Chemicals, you can be using either chlorine, iodine, or quats. Chlorine is kind of like what you'd have in bleach, right? Iodine is going to be its a uh, it turns into a pink solution. The only problem with iodine that I've found is when they use it in a sanitation sink, if they use hot water in that sink and steam starts rising up, the steam hits the walls and before you know it, the wall's turning pink. 
and you can't really get that off. <laughs> it's there. So, um, and then quats are ammonium quat, quat, quaternary solutions. And you see that quite often. Um, chemical sanitizing. Food contact surfaces can be sanitized by either soaking them in a sanitizing solution or rinsing, swabbing, or spraying them down with a sanitizing solution. And then sometimes you may have a special detergent sanitizer blend that you can be used. Uh, it'll be used once to clean and the second time to sanitize. S All right, sanitizer should be mixed with water to the proper concentration. Now, a lot of uh, these nursing homes have uh, chemical companies come out to see them and help make sure that these They'll, they'll have um, dispensers and they'll have it titrated to the correct concentration, but they still have to check it to make sure that it's at an effective level. Uh, not enough sanitizer can make the solution just useless, it's too weak, and too much can make it too strong and actually unsafe and it'll start to corrode metal. So it has to be just right. And if, I don't know if you can see in the picture there, they've got a um, to check the concentration of a sanitizer, you're going to use a litmus paper, and it has to be the correct litmus paper testing unit for if you're using chlorine, iodine, or a quat. If, and then you can't use a chlorine test strip to check the effectiveness of a quat because it won't show you anything. And you have to follow the instructions on that. You dip it, depending on which one it is. There's there's different little things you have to do and then you can hold it up to the chart which is right there with the test strips and see what the concentration is um, and here we go check the concentration with the test kit make sure it's designed for the sanitizer used and those test kits can go out of date they have a date a use by date on them um, the concentration should be checked often uh, especially, especially um, the solution should be changed when this, it gets dirty or the concentration is too low. In other words, it's not as strong as it should be because the longer it sits out there, the more it's, the weaker it's going to get. So usually they'll do like a sanitation bucket like in the morning and do another one at least by lunchtime and probably another one maybe late in the afternoon. Depends on at least a four within a four hour period each time. Temperature, you want to follow the manufacturer's instructions for that. Because some of them have a very specific, especially quats, as when you check the um, concentration, it has to be a certain temperature. Contact time, the sanitizer has to make contact with the object for a specific amount of time. You can't just dip it in and take it out. Sometimes it's thirty seconds, sometimes it's more. Depends on the sanitizer. Now, water hardness and water pH is going to affect the sanitizer, but the supplier usually adjusts for that. Okay, so for chlorine, you're talking about the water temperature is like equal to or less than uh, 100 degrees. The water pH is, is about excuse me, greater than or less or equal to 100 degrees. Uh, the water pH is less than or equal to 10. Am I reading that right? It's been a long time. Right? Okay. Uh, water hardness, the recommendations of the manufacturer. The sanitizer has to be between 50 and 99 parts per million. And it's the same for the different temperature, too. So the contact time is the same. So between 50 and 99 parts per million ppm for chlorine. For iodine, <clears throat> you're going to want to have the concentration range between 12.5 to 25 parts per million. And then for the quad,
you're going to go with whatever the manufacturer's recommendations are. Clean and sanitize. You want to, of course, clean the, get the, the excess dirt and food off. Wash the sub surface, rinse the su surface, then sanitize the surface and allow it to air dry. So scrape, wash, rinse, sanitize, and air dry. And of course, food contact surfaces must be cleaned and sanitized after they're used and before working with a different type of food. Or any time um, a task was interrupted and the items may have become contaminated. And definitely after four hours, if you're still using those items continually for four hours, you need to wash them after that point. Now, stationary equipment, probably the most important thing that a person would need to do and for heaven's sakes, don't be looking at a slicer without making sure it's unplugged. I mean, if you're going to be looking to see if it's got food particles on it, it should be unplugged, okay? And you would also be asking, so is this, if you think that, the, you know, if you want to check it, say, has this been, has this slicer been uh, cleaned? Is it, is it ready to use? Then you would look at it, and there's a, but you want to make sure it's unplugged, and especially you want to have it unplugged if it's, it's being cleaned. But um, you can actually get down there and kind of look at the blade and check it out. But it should be unplugged when we're not in use. Uh, anything that's removable would be washed, rinsed, and sanitized by hand or run through a dishwasher. And, of course, the rest of the equipment at the surface has to be cleaned also. And it would be wash, rinse, sanitize, and air dry. And then, of course, the unit would be put back together. Um, and also, another thing that's used with the slicer, they usually have a, a special glove when handling the blade to, as a safety measure also. Uh, clean in place equipment would be um, the, anything that would hold and dispense TCS food must be cleaned and sanitized every day unless otherwise indicated by the manufacturer. So if you've got like an ice cream soft serve machine, you would, it would probably, depending on, on how often you're using it, I would think it would be cleaned and sanitized at least every, once a day. High temperature machines, and we're talking about machine dishwashing, uh, final sanitizing rooms must be at least 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, there is one machine, it's called a stationary rack single temperature machine. And it uses the same temperature for washing and for rinsing, and that's 165 degrees Fahrenheit. And I've only seen one of those machines. And believe me, if you walk into the kitchen that's got one of those machines, they're going to tell you right up, this is a stationary single temperature machine. <laughs> because otherwise they know you're going to be looking for a machine that's going up to... 180 degrees. Now it is possible for the temperature to get too high. Uh, you can check that in your um, food code, but I believe you don't want the temperature to go higher than 195, 94 degrees, I believe, uh, because at that point it starts turning to steam. But the idea with it being at least 180, it's, you know, it's being sprayed and then it starts sheeting on the, the plates and everything. So by the time it gets there, it's probably 171 degrees on the plate. Chemical sanitizing machines uh, clean and sanitize at a much lower temperature, uh, and you have to just follow the, the guidelines for that, depending on which chemical you're using. Usually a machine, a dishwashing machine, is going to be using a chlorine chemical sanitizer. And if you think about it, you know, even though they take off the scrape, scrape away the most of the food off the plates, there's still going to be food on those plates. It's going to get in the dish machine. So the machine has to be cleaned usually after each meal, like after breakfast, after lunch, after supper. 
at least to the point of where you're, you're pulling out the baskets. Basically, they're like drain traps that are in your sink, but they're in the dish machine, so those have to be cleaned out. The inside has to be rinsed out. And then at least once a week, they're going to be using a delimer on it. And they have curtains between the sections, between like the wash and the rinse if it's a flight type. Uh, they have to use the correct dish racks when they send it stuff through, and it should not be overloaded. The plates and things should be set in such a way so that the, the wash water and the rinse water can get to the surface of the plate so that it's not covered up by something else. In other words, where it's, it shouldn't just be all be piled in there and sent through. It should be stacked in there in such a way where the surfaces are exposed. Uh, and all items should be air dried. And you can, besides using the dials that are on the machine, you can also use the maximum registering thermometers or temperature sensitive tape. They'll take the temperature sensitive tape and like put it on a plate and send it through them. That way they can check to make sure that the rinse temperature is proper. Okay. Now setting up a manual dishwashing operation, <clears throat> your three compartment sink, and of course they have to clean and sanitize each sink and drain board. The drain boards are on either end. Uh, fill the first sink with detergent and water to uh, at least 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Fill the second sink with clean water and fill the third sink with water and if you're using a sanitizer, to the, you use, add that to the correct concentration. Either that or it's going to have to be 171 degrees Fahrenheit for that last sink. There should be a clock over the sink so they can check and see how long the items are in the sanitizing sink. Uh, three compartment sink, it says rinse, scrape, or soak items before washing them. Wash items in the first sink, rinse items in the second sink, and sanitize items in the third sink, and then air dry items on a clean and sanitized surface. Now sometimes what they'll do is they'll have, you know, the drain board right over here. Some things they may have a rack that they can put it on where it can air dry. But it should be air dried before it's stored on the shelves. Because you don't want to have what they call wet nesting, where things have just been put up and they're, they, they haven't fully air dried. And they're still moist and there's water in between the bowls or the plates, things like that. Uh, when storing clean and sanitized tableware and equipment, it should be stored at least six, six inches off the floor. Okay? Again, so you can sweep under it, mop under it. You don't have to worry about splash hitting it. Uh, clean and sanitize drawers and shelves before items are stored. If they're, if they're storing stuff in a, uh, in a drawer, it should be reasonably clean. Sometimes they'll put some parchment paper on the bottom, you know, as a, especially as an older kitchen, um, because sometimes those drawers get kind of beat up. Uh, glasses and cups should be stored upside down in a clean and sanitized shelf or rack or tray. Okay. And silverware should be stored handles up with the, with the eating end down. And sanitize tray, trays and carts that are used to carry your clean tableware and utensils. Uh, when cleaning the premises, clean non-food contact surfaces regularly. That includes your floors, ceilings, walls, and equipment exteriors. Obviously, you're not going to be cleaning the ceiling every day, but as needed, those things are cleaned. So you don't have dust and dirt and residue building up. Um, and cleaning up after people get sick, of course, that's got to be cleaned up immediately. It can carry norovirus, which is highly contagious. Um, usually, they'll most places will get housekeeping to come in. Housekeeping, a lot of times, is also under a uh, contract service. Sometimes the same contract service as the kitchen, uh, and normally they would have most places will have housekeeping come in to clean it up because they're used to cleaning that sort of stuff up and they know the proper procedures and the proper chemicals to use. 
Um, and of course, if you, it's gotten contaminated, you're going to have to throw some food away if someone's gotten sick in that area. And you may need to clean the equipment again. Okay. Storing cleaning tools and chemicals, they should be in a separate area away from food and food prepped areas. Uh, the storage area should have good lighting so you can see the chemicals. Uh, hooks for hanging up cleaning tools, utility sink, for cleaning buckets and washing cleaning tools, and a floor drain for dumping dirty water. <coughs> I went to a facility one time that did not have any kind of utility sink. And that's one thing the food code does say you need to have so that you can throw away the dirty mop water. You're not supposed to just take it out and throw it out in the backyard. Especially not if you have a hose laying in the grass over there that you're using to clean the carts with. Stuff like that. You know, it's just you start thinking about back up into the hose and all that. You know, so they should have a, 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 a proper utility sink in the kitchen to get rid of their dirty mouth, mouth water. It's not supposed to go down in the pot and pan sink. It's not supposed to be going in a hand washing sink. It's supposed to go in a utility sink. Um, never dump mop water or other liquid waste into toilets or ur urinals. Why might that be? If you think about it, a lot of those foodborne illnesses we were talking about are found in the GI tract. And if you are dumping your mop bucket in there, you know, you have, ba have backsplash gets into your mop bucket, and next thing you know, you're spreading all that stuff all over the kitchen floor. It's just not a good, good, it's just not a good practice. Uh, so you want to uh, never, also, never clean tools and sinks used for hand washing, food prep, or dishwashing. And we're talking about cleaning tools. You should have a special area for that. Uh, chemicals, you only purchase those that are approved for use in food service operations. Store them in their original containers, or in their original containers, because that has all the information on it. It has the name of the product on it. It has the safety warnings, the directions. Uh, away from food and food prep areas. And then if you're transferring from them to a new container, like a spray bottle, that should be labeled with the common name of the chemical, clearly labeled. Of course, you want to keep your MSDS, material safety data sheet for each chemical. And when you're throwing anything out that's chemical, you want to follow the instructions on the label and any local regulatory requirements. Uh, to develop an effective cleaning program, they, you have to create a master cleaning schedule, train your staff to follow it. Who's going to do the cleaning? When they're going to do it? What chemicals are they going to use? How often are they going to clean it? And then monitor the program to make sure it's working. A lot of times they'll have like a sign-off sheet for staff. But some things may be just cleaned once a week. Some things may be cleaned daily. Some things may be cleaned each shift. So you identify what should be cleaned, who should clean it, when it should be cleaned, and how it should be cleaned. And check the cleaning task as needed and get staff input. That's always valuable. 